Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 38, A Heavy Topic. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi, anyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. Uh, tonight, Sean and I are going to have a conversation about game weight based on a question from fan Sean Hamilton. After that, I've got a few games I got played, War Chest. Whoa, I'm drawing a blank here. I totally forget what I have going on. I got War Chest, Immortals. I gave Immortals a second chance, and I played some Kodama. And I've got two new DC Comics expansions. Big shock there. <laughs> At some point, you're going to run out. No, you're am. not going to be a more expansion. Sean's just going to start just repeating what I say every show and piss people off. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. We're here for you. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those discussions, feedback we've received, comments on our content, gaming discussions we've been part of, and so on. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. So either we totally nailed the topic last week or no one's actually listened to our latest episode yet because I didn't get a single bit of feedback on our competition topic. Well, I'd like to think we nailed it. I'm hoping that's it. I got to admit, Brian was in the chat. He seemed pretty happy with the way we discussed his topic. And I think we did a great job on it. So I'm just hoping that, you know, with Easter coming up and everything, everyone's busy spring and they're out doing yard work for the first time of the year or something. They've been too busy to actually listen. Maybe not. But anyway, I did get one comment on uh, Tabletop Gaming Weekly Share over on MeWe that I thought was amusing. So I figure we'll share that this week. Ryan Tuxopius writes... This week, I played some Carcassonne and tried a new game called Bonanza, where you're growing bean gardens. It was weird, but enjoyable. Apparently, our hosts don't normally use all the rules as written, so there was no active trading component. We all wound up with 10 coins at the end. Not sure what the odds are that you'll wind up with a four-way tie, but we managed it. Well, I gotta say, it's really odd. A couple things here are really odd. One... Bonanza being called a new game. That the first thing I read that I'm like, this hot try this new game called Bonanza. I'm hoping Ryan means new to him. Maybe he's never heard of it. It is a bit of a hidden gem from way back in the 2000s, early 2000s. Actually, I think even before that, if you go to the German version. Uh, but definitely not something new. Plus, I'm not sure if you can call it Bonanza if there's no active trading. I have to assume that's how you ended up with only 10 coins each, because when I play Bonanza, my score is usually in the 30s and 40s, and usually some other players in the ones and twos, and that's kind of the how it works, because the entire point of the game is trading. Like, it's the, the point of the game is you play your first card, maybe you play your second card, then you pull up two cards to trade. Like, that's the next step in the game. Like, I don't even see if the game works. Now, Sean, you played Bonanza, like, can we, uh, without trading? What? I'm honestly not sure what the game would be without trading. I mean, the hand order aspect does mean that it's sort it, of still a game, I guess. But, but, but it's only all half of then. the game. Um, because without the trading, it, it's half or, or a third of a game. Um, the, the hand, I mean, the hand, the hand order, the ha it makes it a sort of, a, you know, simple uh, it, it's odd. I, I'm not really sure. That's weird. Uh, but 1997 is the date. Oh, there you go. There we go. Late 97, 90s. But yeah, like you have your hand, you can't rearrange the order. So then isn't the game predetermined if you just have to plant it? And then the two cards come up for auction, you got to plant those too. Like, yeah. I, I really don't know. Maybe Ryan will hear this and reply. Maybe they have some additional house rules to make up for the fact there's no trading. Could be. Because I got to admit, it's a little weird. I, I noted Anchi Games in the chat wondered if he wrote the comment on April 1st. And to be honest, I didn't notice the date. So I'm not sure on that. It is possible that, that we just got fooled. That That is, that is possible because Bonanza without trading. I, I'm going to be thinking about that one for a while. I'll, I'll probably have dreams <laughs> about it. I'll try to write a non-trading variant of Bonanza at some point. There we go. 
We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it on YouTube. Thanks to our moderator, Anshi Games. So tonight we're talking about game weight. What I want to hear from the lobby, our chat room, is what weights of games do you prefer? Do you like light filler games that you can play in less than half an hour? Or are you all about the five-hour event game, the slog, the brain burner? I expect most people to be somewhere in between. Yep, we'll be back checking in throughout the show with the chat room. We are here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best place for us to get questions is through the website. That way they don't get lost in the ether. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. This week, we're going to be discussing a topic from Sean Hamilton, who writes... Not exactly a question, but I feel it's a point that should be addressed. The importance of different weights of games. A discussion how it can be useful to have a light game at the start of the night, when you might be waiting for people to show up, and a light game after a heavy game just to recover. I don't know if you could get a full episode out of it, but it might be a valid point to bring up anyways. Well, thanks for the question, comment. Overall, I think it's a question. Uh, Sean, it is appreciated. I, I'm pretty sure we can make a full episode out of anything, so we're going to try. Actually, I, I think there's a lot more to wait than you'd first think. I think there's actually quite a bit to say about it. So first thing I think we need to do, though, is define what we mean by wait when we're talking about tabletop games. No, I... When I put my thoughts down on this, I was thinking more board game side, but I think it's equally applicable to board games as well as RPGs. So you don't hear people say heavy RPG often, you often hear the term crunchy. And I would think if you're looking at RPGs, you're gonna weigh on the side of say Fiasco being a light game that has very little crunch and very little direction versus say a Pathfinder or a Role Master or GURPS for a heavier game. Now, weight's one of those words we use when we're talking about games, right? Uh, we use it to help define and separate one game from another. And it's a way for us to rank games and be able to talk about what we like in games and what we don't like in games and a way to categorize them. Well, the hard part is there aren't really any hard and fast rules out there on what game weight means. Over the years, it's been, the term's been used many times. Uh, maybe Sean, with his internet search, can find out when the term game weight started, but I don't think that's gonna be an easy way to find. But I'm sure it was quite some time ago. As long as I've been gaming, people have been talking about heavy games and light games. And pretty much everyone uses these terms. The problem is no one has really defined exactly what they mean. But in general, weight, ranks complexity. So a more complex game is heavier than a less complex game. A very complex game has a lot of weight. So the problem we have when talking about this is that it's subjective. Like it's pretty much completely subjective because there is no dictionary definition of a medium heavy Euro game. A game that one person considers light, light another person can consider heavy. And I found over the years, a lot of this is driven by the player's personal gaming experience. Because the more games and variety of games a person plays, the more experience they have with a variety of different mechanics, and the easier games are to learn and play for that person because they have that experience. And over time, games start to seem less complex, just in general, because you're familiar with all these terms and mechanics already. And due to this, I find as a person learns more games, their perspective, as far as weight is concerned, shifts. Games slide down the scale. Now, despite being subjective, I think weight's a useful term to use when talking about games. The thing is, you need to know something about the person you're talking to or the podcast you're listening to or the person who's talking about the games to get anything out of the conversation about weight. If you don't know the kinds of games I like or the kinds of games I played and I start talking about a medium weight game, you have no frame of reference. You have no idea what I'm talking about. Like if I say, oh, I really dig medium heavy games, you've listened to the podcast enough times, you probably know I'm probably talking about something like Terra Mystica. 
But meanwhile, you could talk to someone who's new into the hobby, and when they're talking about medium-heavy games, what they're thinking in their mind is Cities and Knights of Catan. And now both those games, Terra Mystica and City and Knights of Catan, are games I've seen her, seen and heard people call medium-heavy games. Now, to me, Cities and Knights is not a medium-heavy game. But if all you played before is Catan, some Flux, and you get the Cities and Knights, and it's like, whoa, this is way more complicated than base Catan, that's a heavy game to you, right? So what you need is that frame of reference. Now, once you have that, I personally think talking about weight makes a lot of sense. It gives you a measurement for discussing games and figuring out if a game is right for you and your group. Yeah, it was interesting. I was actually uh, jumped in recently on a uh, Pangea Games uh, Twitter thread where they had discussed, you know, what is the value of board game weight? Is it valuable? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and does it impact your playing group? Uh, and for me, I, I found it does have value, uh, but yeah. it's very, it's, I mean, again, as, as you've said, it's very subjective. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think uh, measurements like they have on Board Game Geek to two decimal places are <laughs> ridiculous. Um, I realize that as a statistical analysis, the, 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 uh, the extra decimal points have value. But to me, you know, it's a one or a five. It's a, you know, a one or a three. But the difference between a three and a three point five is utterly meaningless in the the grand scheme of things, uh, especially yeah. when we get into a little later when we get into actually if we if we start talking about how these things are rated, um, the uh, the the weight distribution on these games uh, and how people rate them is highly skewed for for various yeah. various reasons uh, that make a lot of sense. But uh, there's a reason why there's only uh, you know a few games that are rated at five. See, for me, especially with the board game geek ratings, all I want to know is, again, I need a, I need a touchstone, I need a basis point, and then I want to see if a game is heavier or lighter than that game. And the actual number doesn't matter. So in my head, like knowing my collection, I'm thinking like to me, Food Chain Magnet is up there. And I'm thinking about buying a new game. I'm going to go on Board Game Geek and I'm going to look up the weight of Food Chain Magnet, which I think we figured out earlier was like 4.2. Yeah, so it's 4.20, right? And I don't care that it's a 4.20. What I care is that I'm looking at, I'm not going to think of a game off the top of my head. Say The Colonists, which actually I don't know the rating on that. I want to see, is The Colonists heavier or lighter than Food Chain Magnet? Because, you know, I want something heavy that I'm going to dig into. This is a big six-hour game, and I want it to be a brain burn. So before I buy it, I want to check the Board Game Geek rating on The Colonists and see if it's higher or lower than Food Chain Magnet. And if it's higher, I'm going to be more willing to buy the game because that's what I'm looking for. Or sometimes the opposite, uh, especially with war games. If my my level of war gaming is I'm a fan of Hammer of the Scots and the block games from Columbia Games. And that's about as heavy as I want to get. I don't want a big chit based game where I have to figure out the ratio of chits in my stack to the ratio of your chits and look on the appropriate terrain table and then take into effect the fog of war and everything else. That's just not me. So again, if I'm thinking of trying a new war game, I'm going to look up the rating for Hammer or the Scots, which I again, I have no clue. And I'm going to be like, OK, would I like Combat Commander Europe? Well, if it's heavier than Hammer of the Scots? No, probably not. So I'm going to stay away from Combat Commander. And just to uh, fill in the audience, uh, Hammer of the Scots is a 2.98. Uh, and The Colonists <laughs> is a 4.06. So it is below Food Chain yeah, Magnet. it is there below you go. Food Chain Magnet. Um, yeah, so it's it, absolutely. Uh, and for a great reference, I think, especially for listeners of this uh, podcast, uh Roll for the Galaxy, uh, race, sorry, race for the Galaxy race. is uh, 2.9, I believe. So right on that three so right level. Right in the middle. So the, yeah. the middle of that scale is Race for the Galaxy. So you're either, you're either going to be more difficult than or less dif difficult than Race for the Galaxy. And I think that's actually a pretty good way to, to gauge things. Would, wouldn't Race actually be towards the medium heavy? Wouldn't 2.5 be middle? Uh, oh yeah, I guess yeah. I guess I keep yeah. thinking, I keep thinking of of three as as sort of and and skipping those extra decimal places. Yeah, two point um, five technically would so a little below race. Well, would except be, except I I don't think that is except actually it starts accurate. at one not zero. So. It starts it starts at one not zero, but also um, the statistical analysis was showing that there was a distinct uh, hesitance to rate a game at five. Yeah. Uh, so what 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 it what it finds or at least the suspicions as to the reasons for the the data that they were finding. Uh, in this uh, 
2013 analysis I was looking at is it's really easy to look at a game and say, oh no, this is simple. You know, you can't mm -hmm. really get much easier than Loop and Louie, which is yeah. you know, the highest rated 1.0 game. And so it's really easy to rate a game down, but it's hard to say, oh, well, there's nothing harder than this. Yeah. Uh, and so, it, you know, in theory, a five is the hardest game. And so it's temp it's it's hard for someone to say, well, I can't think of a game harder than this, so I'm mm. going to rate it a five. When a lot of people, for various reasons we've already sort of touched on, I, you know, as you get more difficult and you get into more difficult games, oh yeah, this game was hard, but ah, oh, there must be something harder than this, so let's yeah. call it a four point five. I can um, see that. So I so I think on Board Game Geek, it isn't unreasonable to think of the three as more of a <laughs> midpoint than the two point five. Yeah, I agree. That that's totally fair. Like that's just like on their normal rating scale. I personally think a six is is a decent game. Yep. Instead of a five, a six to me is this is a good game. I'll play it. Yeah, six is Whereas okay. Anything, we'll play in the mood. Yeah, six six to me is I'll I'll play it. Like if yeah. someone asks me to play, I'm probably not going to say no. I may not rush out to play it, but yeah. So so to me, a six is a, a passing grade, right? <laughs> if yeah. you want to put it that way. Yeah, five is that mediocre where you know if you're desperate, yeah. if there's nothing else you to play, yeah, sure, I guess I'll play it. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, actually, I'm curious, since you obviously have Board Game Geek open, do they define weight? Like, is there a little question mark next to the weight? Well, it's actually weight isn't precisely defined. They specifically oh, nice. say weight isn't precisely defined. Uh, now, and they're actually calling it now a complexity rating. It's okay. not, uh, so it's called weight, but it's actually defined as a complexity rating. All right. Uh, which is, uh, and that is defined as the community rating for how difficult a game is to understand. Mm. And so they specifically call out the understanding of the game, which okay. to me, makes it even more of a sliding scale yes. than, than anything else because I couldn't understand Race for the Galaxy. I struggled right. with Race for the Galaxy. But then I've also sat down at, uh, uh, not Galaxy Trucker, the... Uh, um, uh, Zaya? Well, well, yeah, let's like use Zaya, for example. Where Zaya is... You see, massively more complex really i think yeah. than than race of the galaxy and yet it was really easy to understand um mm -hmm. and it's just because of my experience and, and where i'm used to so it's you know very much your mileage may vary uh yeah looking at the understanding now they do break out some some different uh combinations and some ideas that i think we're going to touch on as we move on but uh it's it's an interesting an interesting system all right so next, I want to talk about what contributes to a game's weight. So what makes a game heavy or light? So one of the problems when trying to define a game's weight is that there are so many contributing factors. Uh, we've already kind of alluded to this. It's not just one thing that makes one game heavier than another, but rather many different factors, all of which contribute to a game's weight. And I want to talk about some of those factors. So these are, are some of the ones. Uh, no, I don't know if this matches the Board Game Geek list at all or how they, they put theirs together. This is my thoughts on what makes a game way more. I will admit I did a quick Google search just to make sure I didn't miss anything, but uh, these were ones that the bellhop thinks are what contribute to the difficulty of the game. And this one I almost didn't put on the list, but I think it does matter because it doesn't actually affect the game and it may not affect every player of the game, and that's the rule book. Because this only matters to the person who read the rules and taught it. Not everyone... Um, learns games from the rule book. But I feel I need to put this on just because of one specific game that I taught myself to play that I think no one should ever teach themselves to play, and that's Starfleet Battles. I sat down and bought, I don't know, the Captain's Edition or something like that, and this is the Star Trek board game. And I tried to read the rules and teach Deanna how to play this game and oh my god like it was like brain burning just trying to get through the rules it was hard and I went on the internet which this is a few years back so the internet wasn't quite as big as it was then I don't even think there was Facebook at the time but I went on some local forums and I was like what the heck is with this game I swear this game it has an oral tradition like the only way you actually learn how to play Starfleet Battles is to have some old grognard who's a Starfleet Battles fan teach you to play and when I said that I had a bunch of grognards go yes that is exactly how you teach people People to play starfleet battles is handed down not self-taught so yes it's it, that is why i think the rule book contributes to game weight because i gotta admit 
once I got Starfleet Battles kind of down, it wasn't that bad. But my God, trying to read that rule book. And I had the same thing when I first tried to learn uh, Wizard Kings, which is a Columbia block game that is a step above um, Hammer of the Scots. And like I read it and it kept talking about hex sides and I did not understand what it meant about hex sides and it talked about mountain hex sides, river hex sides. Well, it's a war game term. It's the side of the hex that contains a river passing through it would be a river hex side. But I'd never seen that term hex side before. So one of the things that does contribute to game weight, though may not in your individual case, because someone might teach you to play is the rule book. How thick is it? How easy is it to read? Are you looking at something like Starfleet Battles that has a chapter or Subchapters, headings, subheadings, and subheading reference numbers like C rule 1.5.7.6C, or is the rule book one sheet of paper with rules that fit on one side? Well, and this also this is also a little more complex. And Board Game Geek does specifically ref re, uh, refer to this um, as part of it. Uh, but the problem is a little more complex. Whereas if you have one sheet of paper that rules that fit on one side, that's great, unless they're unreadable. Well, yes. And so you've got the problem of not only is size a factor, but readability and usability of the rule mm -hmm. book. So um, when you're looking at game weight, you can have something, you know, that fits on a single page and is great. Um, I, something like, you know, an Azul sort of, sort of concept mm -hmm. where it's just really easy. Or you could have something that's got a lot more pages, but is so well written that it's just, you know, you just quickly read through it and, and it flows mm -hmm. nicely and everything you could want is right there. And then you've got something like Masters of the Universe, which <laughs> <laughs> yes. is completely broken because yeah. of the rule book. The rules actually aren't there. It's not, it's yeah. not playable. Um, and then uh, you get into stuff like uh, Galaxy Trucker, people complain about the rule book. Shafausa. Because they've mixed their flavor text in with the rules, mm. making it that much more harder to comprehend on top of being, you know, already a, a weightier game. Uh, so there's, there's a whole lot of aspects when it comes to the rule book, uh, whereas thickness, I mean, maybe they've got a lot maybe. of well-placed flavor text, graphics, mm -hmm. examples, and maybe that thicker rule book is easier, uh, than the thinner rule book, but, uh, it is definitely a guideline to the rule book in general, not necessarily thick, but, uh, yeah. but the rule book in general is absolutely a factor in weight. No, that's a, that's a really good point. Actually, for a really good example of that, if anyone has played Russian Railroads, Russian Railroads has a nice, thick, probably 20-ish page book, but it's color-coded and broken up, and there's actually a section halfway through the book that says, if you're reading this as going through, take a break right now, because we've given you a lot to absorb. Put down the book for a minute and set out the board, because that'll help you learn the next section. Like, that's right in the rule book, and it tells you to do that. And I'm like, it was the most beautiful book ever. And it's a worker placement game where the different spots of the board are color-coded. Well, the rule book's also color-coded. So if you're looking how to do the purple action you just flip to the purple section of the book it, it is in my opinion still the best game rule book i've ever read whereas shafausa for a board game is the worst though mass of the universe is an even better example to yeah. jump into well technically it's called an rpg <laughs> but uh, yeah and, that and i mean generally speaking like uh anything by uve rosenberg is a good example of a book you know they write yep. good good manuals for uh you know fields of arl is, is, is mm -hmm. called out as a great example um really well written stuff puerto rico another good uh yeah good the old the old mayfair is it mayfair de puerto rico it's either uh, mayfair or rio grande i think it's mayfair or it might be rio grande whoever it is that used to do those old games that did all the alia games are great because they do they use the sidebars which no one seems to do that nowadays so you have all the rules and then on the right there's a sidebar that just summarizes them which are fantastic for when you put the game down for a couple of years and then pick it up to play yeah. i can grab puerto rico and i honestly don't remember exactly how to play puerto rico right now but i can go through that book and just read the sidebars and then be like oh yeah that's right yeah you're picking between the five rules and the five rules are this okay and what's the what's the mayor do yet yeah, the mayor does this okay the builder does this and without having to read every paragraph Paragraph. That company was fantastic for, for that style. Rio Grande, yeah. yeah. Rio Grande games, uh, fantastic rule books for everything they've ever made. All right. All and right. Next up. 
Up next, I've got game length. So this is, I, I'm generalizing big here because in general, the longer games are heavier and short games are lighter. Now, the second part of this, short games are lighter, I find pretty much universally true just because it's hard to have a fast, heavy game, right? If you want the game to be quick, there can't be that much meat there or that many decisions to make or that many pieces to play with, right? To make the game quick, you got to make it simple. But it's not as certain with longer games because I have played some pretty light games that go on for a long time. Uh, one of the famous games that people like to do it, and I'm going to make the joke here, is Munchkin squeezes half an hour of fun in two hours of gameplay because there's not enough game there. It's a really simple light game, but man, that game could go on forever. So it's not universally true that longer games are heavier, but I do find that the shorter the game is, generally the lighter it is. But Either way, light can contribute to weight. Uh, a six-hour game is probably got to have some weight to it to keep people involved for six hours. And that's where the colonist comes back in. The colonist, each individual turn is not that complicated, but the fact you're going to be playing a six-hour slog and there are actual rules for saving the game partway through adds to the weight of that game. Yeah, I, I mean, there are, and I think there are exceptions that prove the rule. Um, if you look at something like Go, for example, mm -hmm. um, Go is not a light game. No, <laughs> uh, but you can play a, a go game in half an hour. Um, so, but I mean, I think that re again, that's something, you know, one of those examples that proves the rule. It, you don't get too many games like go that have been mm -hmm. developed over, you know, thousands of years or whatnot. Um, so yes, you're absolutely going to, going to stretch out the game, uh, not only game length, uh, but what goes along with that is how much time are you putting into, um, that game? You know, how much time are you putting into thinking about things? Oh. Yeah, I'm going to come back to that in a yes. bit later, actually. That comes up. So up next, I got luck. Uh, again, this is fairly general, but most of the time, games with high randomness are usually lighter than games with as many random factors. And the main reason for this is that randomness removes the cognitive load by removing the ability to plan ahead and strategize. You can't pre-plan your turn when you don't know what event's going to come up, or you can't no, what's going to, you can't plan six moves ahead when, when you move to the next square, you're going to roll the dice to see what happens next. And you can't plan to get out of the mansion if you're playing a roll and move game and you may roll one every turn, right? So that is one way that uh, random factors are going to limit weight of a game. Now, this isn't necessarily saying that heavy games can't have random elements. And I got to say, sometimes having those elements can make a game more complex. So having the fact that a random event's going to come up can totally change your strategy and change your planning. Or even more different, having people having hands of cards. This is why card games can often be fairly high complexity. Is yes, you have a random head of cards, but if everyone knows what all the cards are in the deck, you can start doing that math of what are the odds that guy has an ace. But if you're playing, say, Zhang Guo, what are the odds that the person's already played their um, two high-ranked nobles already? Out of the three cards left, do they have a 53 or not? If you, or is it going to be higher or lower than your card? That actually can add to the weight. So, again, it's kind of like game length. The main thing to note, though, is that luck can affect the weight of a game. Now, for examples of more hobby board games, King of Tokyo, you can't plan ahead. It is all dice. It is all random. You, you, you may have a strategy of I plan to stay in Tokyo as long as possible or no, I'm going to stay outside of Tokyo. But really, other than that, and then on your turn, if you don't roll any punches, you're not getting into Tokyo anyway. So there's no point in trying to plan ahead. So you've which, got which like, is why which is why King of Tokyo is rated at 1.4. Yeah, exactly. It's really way low on that scale. Now. For a dice-based game with a lot of weight, look at Madeira. You're rolling dice at the beginning of that game and placing them around the board, and it's probably up there in the four point somethings, 4.1, 4.2, I'm going to guess. That one I don't have handy, but... Uh, ah, that's good. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Luck is a huge thing. Um, but again, it's, it's one of those things where a little bit goes a long way. Uh, so a heavy luck game is probably going to be a lighter game, but when you add just that touch of luck, like your dice tower in Immortals or in Wallenstein. Um, yeah. it's, 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 not, it's, it's luck, but with complete knowledge. So you know how many pips there are in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that there are a certain number of pips in the tower. And if you're really good, you know exactly how many pips are in the tower. Yeah. Uh, but you don't know how many are going to drop through. Uh, and so that bit of randomness, uh, mm -hmm. yes, you can plan ahead, but you don't know all the outcomes. 
uh, and and that just adds to the complexity of uh, games like those. All right, up next, I've got cognitive load. This is a term for how much you need to try to keep in your head at one time in order to successfully play the game. So this is how many factors are going to influence each decision that has to be made. Basically, the more you have to keep track of, the more complex the game becomes. So speaking of each, Sean just mentioned Immortals. So I found Immortals to be extremely heavy. I would almost say heavier than Wallenstein and Shogun, though I don't know if it's rated that way, because not only am I trying to remember how many of my cubes are in the tower, I'm also trying to keep track of two map boards, how many units people have on their map boards, what provinces people have already used, which provinces they controlled at the beginning of the game, because even though someone has more cubes on a spot, they may not have that province card, because that's how that game works, um, how much money people have, the amount of income different provinces uh, generate. So I happened to notice last turn that they harvested Fire Home and Fire Home gave him six gold. So I have to try to remember, I want to take Fire Home so I can tax it next turn. And like the number of factors to think of in that game is impossible to keep track of. But then that game is highly random. So trying to think about that, all that, I realized in Immortals is pointless because I'm just going to attack and they're going to attack back and then someone else is going to attack and then someone's going to steal that spot anyway because there's so many fights and that tower, you're going to drop so many cubes that planning that far of ahead is just a waste of time because of the random factor in the game. But that's what you have to look at in cognitive load, right? So Azul is a good example of a relatively high cognitive load because you're not only worrying about what tiles are out on the board. You're looking at what tiles you need. You're also trying to remember how many more tiles are left in the bag. And the more you play Azul, the more you get into the game, the more you start realizing how much this matters. Like who else is collecting the same color tile as you? And what does your opponent want? And what's the odds they're going to draft this before you do, right? And that's part of what makes Azul good is the longer you play it, the more you're going to get these little things that are important that you may not have realized are important at the beginning. Yeah, no, and uh, Board Game Geek refers to this as, uh, and I think this is the equivalent, it's a little different, but what proportion of time is spent thinking and planning instead of resolving your actions? So how much time are you spent thinking instead of doing? Okay, um, so I kind of split this off. When I get yeah, to the next I, I, topic, that's an, part of it too. Yeah, and there's a, there's a few different ones, and we and you've kind of you've kind of forked your your uh, concepts a little bit. Um, and then the other the other concept that sort of also ties in is how hard and long do you have to think to improve your chance of winning? Um, right. Is there is there other uh, there other one that sort of works along along this same uh, thought? And it's you know again it's it's if you just roll and move, there's there's no cognitive load there. You're just mm -hmm. you're just rolling and you know reading whatever. Yeah, comes there's up nothing to, there's nothing to keep in your head. Yeah, there's no there's no brain time. If you can spend the entire game talking with your friends about what happened during the day, that's a low cognitive load game. Mm -hmm. um, if you're telling your friend to shut up, even though he's trying to save your life because you're lighting on fire, but you're so focused on the game, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. That's a high cognitive load. Exactly. Good example. <laughs> Hold on. I'm trying to make my move. Like, dude, you're, you're on fire. <laughs> <sighs> Is that the whole, you're, you can tell they're thinking so hard, there's smoke coming out of their ears? Yeah. It, it ties in with that. So yeah, this this ties in with the last one. I personally think it's it's separate, in my opinion, than cognitive load. Because cognitive load is what you have to remember. Up next, I have the size of the decision tree. So this is your turn starts. How many options do you have? So is there one move? Is there two moves? Are there 30? What can you do? Is there an obvious action to take each round? So this is a thing. So thinking of Ascension as an example, one of the complaints people have about Ascension is that it's a game that plays itself because you just buy the most expensive card that's out there every round. That actually reduces the weight of Ascension because in most cases, not all cases, that is true. In Ascension, you're going to add up your your points and you go i have six to buy you're going to buy the six card and the only time you're going to really make a decision if there's two six cards to pick from there's there's very few exceptions to that whereas other games which from what i understand the dc deck builder that doesn't happen as often it's much more about sculpting your deck and getting things that work well together or for a better example i think of star realms buying by faction is way more important than star realms than necessarily buying the most expensive card but the whole point is how big is that decision tree right so in both those games you're only looking at the option of buying six different cards 
Oh, I guess there's the the extra cards on the side. I can't remember what they're the ones you can always buy. The punch and kick or whatever it is, yeah. or the the explorer in yeah. in Star Realm. So seven choices each turn, right? So that's the size of the decision tree. You can have another game where. There, you can have a, a very complex looking a game with a lot of different moving parts, but each time it's time to take your turn, there's actually only a small number of options. And that's a game where it's not actually as heavy as it looks. And the perfect example of that to me is Anachrony. Whenever I set up Anachrony, people are like, whoa, I don't know if I want to play this, man. This looks so complicated. But when you start Anachrony, the first turn of the game, you have literally six options. That's it. It's I go here, 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 and here. And one of those options is steal first player. So really, you're down to five options, especially for the first player. And then it's very clear which of those options is going to be the right choice. So you're probably down to three valid options your first turn of the game. Second turn of the game, you probably got the same thing. You got about six options. By the time you get into round two, you probably now built buildings. And by building buildings, those give you a new worker placement spot. So your tree starts to branch, but it branches slowly. So as the game goes on, you get more decisions. But at that point, you're learning the game. So the decisions aren't as complicated and the ones you want to take are probably more obvious. So I think Anachrony, well, a weighty game isn't nearly as heavy as it looks on the table. It's huge table presence, lots of tokens, lots of stuff going on, but really there's not that many different choices in the game at the beginning of the game. Now it branches out to a nice heavy masterpiece at the end, but by the time it gets you there, you've slowly taken baby steps along the way. So you're ready for it. Yeah, no, that's a great way to do it. And I, you know, again, if you're if you're concerned about what decision tree is, think chess. You know, how yeah. many possible moves can I make? Uh, and the reason, and and you have to balance this as well because again, decision trees are uh, like all of these things are really. It's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, chess is sort of easily winnable by computers because it is completely known, and you can look ahead if you if you can look ahead through all the decision tree you can pick the best move. Now, humans can't tend to do that in most games. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you are completely limited, uh, if, you're, if your decision tree is all laid out in front of you and you do have that perfect information, uh, that can lower the weight down depending on the size of the, the, size of the tree, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why having that little bit of random in there, you know, ups the weight uh, at, a, at a certain, you know, within that certain balance because it makes that decision tree unsearchable. You can't search to the end of your decision tree to find the optimal move right. because you don't have all that information. Up next, I've got how hard is the game to grok? Will players get it after the second round or where is it going to take multiple plays before everyone's picked up on the nuances of the game? Now, this one's rather nebulous and very, very player dependent. But to me, it's an important factor on determining how heavy a game is. Uh, the game I want to use for an example here is Red 7, because the mechanics are really simple. You play a card, you can play a second card, and by the end of your turn, you have to be winning the game. And if you're not winning the game, you're out. Like, that's pretty much it. It sounds fairly simple. But you really have to play a full game, a full game round, before you get it on how you should be doing that and what it means to be winning and what what order you should play your cards in. And then it takes a few more plays, like full game plays, before you actually learn how to play it well. But this is generally considered a lighter game. But that adds to the weight of the game because there is a knack or a skill that you have to learn to be able to actually get the game. Uh, going back to Anachrony, that's another one where the first three rounds, people are like, I don't know what I'm doing, but by round three, they tend to get it. And I'm surprised, because like I said, it looks like this huge, heavy game. But by round three, you've kind of got the whole game. And going back to our teaching game episode, that's when, if you're teaching an acrony, it's round three, you wipe the board, start over, and start from the beginning, because now everyone's got it. Now, there are other games, as Sean keeps mentioning chess, that it takes years and years, and maybe you never get it. And some masters are still working on getting it better. Yeah, no, it's uh, <clears throat> this is definitely a thing, and it's actually to the point where uh, Board Game Geek broke this up into two sec this this particular point into two separate points. So it's how long does it take to learn the rules? Uh, okay. Chess, for instance, you can learn the rules very quickly. You know, pawns. You know, you've only got a few a few number of pieces, mm -hmm. and they all move in very discrete ways. Boom, you're done. You memorize what how the pieces move. The rules are over. You know, there's a couple of little tricks like castling, but generally it's easy to learn. 
but then how many times do you need to play before you feel like you get the game? Yeah. Is the second point. And that's the very different thing. So there's two, they break it up into those two sec- separate things. Uh, so it's, it's the rules and then understanding the game. Um, is are, are, are sort of two aspects of the same thing here. And yeah, sure. You can pick up Azul and, and, and learn the, learn how to, how to play real quickly. It's, you know, mm-hmm. you, you pick up a tile and you match it in the right place. They all have to be the same. If you get too many, they break done. Getting that game is going to take you a couple of plays and, and watch, especially, you know, if you're, if you're, all, if you're all new, that's one thing, but you know, if you're playing up against with someone else, that's, uh, that's going to pick up quickly. So I kind of did break it up myself as well, because the next one I was going to bring up is learning curve. So to me, learning curve is that how long it takes to learn it. So this one, I was going to go back to race for the galaxy because in general, I don't consider it to be overly heavy, but man, that game has a learning curve. Like you can teach flux in under a minute, like literally two minutes, but Race for the Galaxy is going to take you way longer, and it's going to be very dependent on who you're teaching and their ability to, I guess, translate iconography effectively that's going to matter, and then trying to apply that to the game rules. And to me, how long a game takes to teach or learn not only influences its weight, but it's also a really good indicator of how heavy a game is going to be in the end. So if I have to sit down uh, for an hour to learn how to play a game, I know it's going to be a heavy game once we get playing. Like if you're investing that much time up front and I'm thinking of two specific games here that my friend Neil keeps trying to convince me to play and Feudum is one of them. And he says it's it's about a 40 to 50 minute teach just to teach the game before you get in and start playing. And I'm like, wow, Neil, I know you dig heavy games, but I don't know if I want to invest an hour just to learn to play a game and then invest another four to play it like that's that's up there. I'm not sure on that one. And he's like, no, no, it's great. You got to do it at some point. And we still haven't actually bought into trying it. But just knowing that it's going to take an hour for Neil to teach me this game, I know it's a heavy game, right? Like the light games don't take as long to teach. Yeah, I mean, Feudum's Feudum's up there. It's a 4.55. Yeah. Um. (laughs) So that's heavier than any game I own. Yeah. So, uh, but apparently it's only an 80 to 180 minute game. Uh, <laughs> and and that's without the teach, I'm assuming, because right, yeah, you got to yeah, add that's... another sixty minutes on top of right, that yeah, just to learn to play. So, so eighty minute fastest game after <laughs> you've learned. After uh, you've learned, yeah. so you almost spend more time learning to play than actually playing. And to me, that sounds broken. Like that doesn't sound <laughs> enjoyable. I guess you only have to learn to play once, yeah, right? Exactly. Um, but yeah, so yeah, this 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 again falls right into that how how hard right into that the same sort of section as yeah. how hard is it to grok? Uh, you can you can you can grok the rules, but you still need to to figure out how those rules are implemented uh, mm-hmm. and how they interact with the players and the the system of the game. Once you understand those basic rules, I mean, tic tac toe is is easy. You put an X or you put an O, um, but you still have to think about where you're going to put them and and yes. Obviously, if you figure it out easy, uh, easily enough, but it's still it is still there's there's that separate level between knowing that you can put an X or put an O and then figuring mm-hmm. out where to put those. Up next, I've got the skill required because some games actually require some technical skill to be able to play well. So the most common, obviously, in our hobby, at least obvious to me, is games requiring you to be good at math. That this is very common in the board game world, whether it's keeping track of points, whether it's score. Um, the most obvious uh, one that comes up the all the time is there's a power grid. People like to call it math the game. Um, other people call they call these kind of games spreadsheet games, right? Uh, there's a lot of people who don't like these kind of games. If you think power grid is math the game, try power grid factory manager because that is one that I felt like I was playing with the spreadsheet that put it to that level that I'm like, okay, no power grid. It's not math a game power grid factory manager which is a standalone game uh it was just felt like i was i was manipulating numbers i gotta admit i didn't enjoy it and i like power grid now these games are going to reward players for being good at and quick at math the uh, turns are going to go quicker they're going to be able to pull things out like when we played arc right at the cg realm for the first time there was a point in the game where every player pulled out their phone so they could bring out their calculator to plan their next move we had one of the players literally sat there with a notepad and pencil planning out 
her final move of the game to optimize the most points she could get. And this took some time and it was all math based. It was, I'm going to get these points. They're going to get these points. And if I go there, it's going to cost me five bucks. And then these five bucks are going to get turned into eight bucks. So that's a three buck gain every one I do. So if I do eight of those, eight times three is 24 point and so on. Right now, there's a lot of games that use math, but besides that, some games actually require the players to be good at other things. Um, I'm sure there are more than what I thought of here, but the one I kept thinking of was deduction. So there are a lot of deduction games. Now, I'm not talking social deduction. I'm talking about like the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective style games, the escape room games, games where you literally have to deduce the answer, where there's logic puzzles the other one is again we never did find out the name of it but the block puzzles right people who are good at block puzzles there is um ricochet robots is the game that's all about those kind of block puzzles mansions of madness adds in mastermind style logic puzzles where you know you have to get cast five numbers and it's going to tell you how many of the numbers are right and how many are in the right place uh those are all skill-based things where people can learn the skills of the games can practice can get better at them and if you're not skilled at those things you're not going to do well in the games and all of that adds weight to a game no absolutely uh and then you know i mean we can go as simple as obvious as you know a skill when you're looking at skill required uh dexterity games are a skill yeah. required uh, to one net, to one uh, aspect, but that doesn't necessarily add weight. Uh, whereas weight is your math. Uh, you know, reading reading comprehension in, in to some degree uh, can be an action or and thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, if you you know there are games where if you are able to go through and prune that decision tree uh, further and faster than other players, you will be better at it. Chess being a perfect example right there. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it's interesting, actually. Uh, Power Grid ranks slightly heavier than Power Grid Factory Manager. Weird. Uh, not much, but I mean, it's it's you know within yeah. within error probably, but uh, it is slightly rate does rate slightly higher harder. That's interesting. I personally would think Factory Manager is higher, but maybe it's just because I'm not that good at basic math, <laughs> uh, As, but which is why I never keep score when we play games. Yeah. Uh, you know, Arkwright is ranked up there as a math game in a big way. Yeah. Uh, Beyond Baker Street is a slightly lighter um, math game. Uh, you Beyond got... Baker Street sounds like it should be a deduction game. That's a math game? Wow. It's, yeah, it comes out as a math game. Uh, and then you've got uh, 1830 uh, Railways and Robber Barons. Oh, yeah, all the 18XX yeah. games are all math. All your economic <laughs> games, right? Even going back to the, the basic Acquire yeah. back in the day is all about the stocks and manipulating it. Uh, and stockpile is another one that comes up. Uh, it's, that one's uh, supposed to be good. And speculation. Uh, that's definitely you're going to be your your hardcore math. Uh, math. Yeah. Any any game. probabilities? Probabilities come up in a lot of games. The other one too is memory. Right. There's trying to remember how many cubes are in the cube tower. Right. And that's also the primary thing for most card games. Right. Heart spades. All those trying to, to to actually remember what cards people have and know based on what cards you have and your partner has and what people played, what the, your opponents must have. That was something my dad used to be fantastic at, and it was a skill I was never able to develop. Yeah, but I have, he was so good at card counting. I have to say, I am just abysmal at, at <laughs> card counting and planning, even Azul. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the things I struggle with on a lot of those games is I don't focus well on that whole, you know, grasping the total number of tokens yeah. and what's what's been pulled and what hasn't. Um, and so I, I generally try to plan strategies that don't rely on that because mm -hmm. I know I, it's just not how my brain works. Yeah, there's very few games I can get. Azul, I can do it, but I can't. I can only like watch one color at a time type of thing. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I know I'm going to try to get over five blues, so I'm going to try to count the blues this game. Right. I can do one color, but that's it, right? And I don't even remember what it is. It's a 40 of each tile in the in the thing or 20. I used to know how many of each tile so I could actually figure it out. And I, I did that a couple times in Azul, but Azul is such a quick game. Usually I just don't bother. Yeah. I'm like, eh. Uh, up next, I've got AP, so analysis paralysis. This comes up on the show quite often. This is the how long it takes you to actually figure out what to do. Now, this really is probably a factor of cognitive load and decision trees above, uh, as they're probably the biggest things that cause analysis paralysis, right? So how much are you trying to remember and how many different options are you presented with? Uh, the biggest one, though, I thought was a factor here that separates it from the other ones is how much does the board state change so can you plan your turn ahead if you look 
at the board and you see, I'm going to move here, here, and here and get this thing. And then by the time it comes around to your turn, you can move here, here, and here and get this thing is completely different than a game where, well, in between this part blew up and then this board changed. Now there's a bad guy in the way here. So I can't move here, here, and here. Um, a good example that the Chons played is Wasteland Express Delivery Service. You're going to sit there on your turn and go, I'm delivering this here and I'm going to make six credits and I'm going to buy this gun. But then by the time it comes around to your turn, someone's moved the, I don't know, the Raiders in the way. And not only that, someone beat you to the city, has already delivered the gun. So now they don't even want guns anymore. So what the heck am I going to do? And here's this whole board in front of me. Yeah. And then the AP is way higher because you're like, well, I now have to plan my entire turn from scratch as soon as my turn starts. So maybe I shouldn't even call this AP. I probably should have called it something separate. But it's the amount of time spent thinking yep. is what is a factor for a game's weight. And again, uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, though, Board Game Geek called it the amount of time thinking versus resolving. So right. you can take a game where the actual playing of all your pieces and laying out of all your stuff takes a lot of time. And that's different than the amount of time it takes to think about what you I mean. You, could, yes. you might only be able to do one thing on a turn. Um, but if it takes you 20 minutes to figure that out, that's a yeah. harder game than something that takes you 20 minutes to lay out all your pieces but you knew as soon as your turn started what you were going to do. Right. Um, so they both turns take 20 minutes, but the, the, the way that turn is, is laid out, uh, brain versus action, is what gives it the weight factor. That's an interesting one. That actually makes me think back to Starfleet Battles because planning your turn took time, right? Like there, there is a cognitive, there's a lot to think about, a lot of decisions to make, and you would make notes because you would pre-plan your turns without anyone else seeing, right? Because it's hidden movement. But man, playing it out took forever, right? So it's, it's kind of like the D&D &D joke about how a five-minute combat takes three hours real time, right? Because... By the time you actually played it out, Starfleet Battles is all in impulses, and you start at impulse 100 and count down to 99, 98, 97, and then depending on how much energy you put into movement, you'll move at different impulses, and it was a way to keep track of ships moving at different speeds, and at impulse 6, I'm going to move forward one hex, and then at impulse 8, I'm going to move another hex, and at impulse 10, I'm going to move another hex. At impulse 12, I'm going to fire a torpedo, but then every impulse, that torpedo is going to move, and like actually playing out those turns would take hours. So like the actual planning was like, sit down go, okay, I'm going to move three hexes and I want to fire torpedoes here. Done. Now an hour goes by as you move little chits on a hex board, right? Yep. And yep. look up rules in between because you got to figure out, just wait, do torpedoes move one hex or two? And, oh, it missed. Does it route loop back around or keep going straight and so on? So I, that's one that definitely uh, uh, ties in with that. Well, even something like Warhammer Fantasy Battle, uh, I, I don't, I know, I, I can't speak to it recently because I know it's changed so much. But even back in the day, um, there were so many details of measuring and checking your line of sight and measuring your wheeling and all these mm -hmm. actual things. You could look at the board and even though it was going to change as your other the other player played, as soon as they were done, you probably had a pretty good idea of which units were going to move mm -hmm. in which directions and what you wanted to do. But the actual movement of those units was painstaking and yeah. <laughs> frustrating. Or, or a modern example, X-Wing. Like, how long does it take you to set your dial to what you want to do with your ships and put them down in front of your ships? That could take a while. But then it's flipping them all over in order and putting out your movement marker, putting out your thing, moving your ship to the end, and so on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that, that covers our list pretty well. Um, the only thing I would say that I don't think we really covered at all, and I mean, uh, Board Game Geek doesn't touch on this either, but I, to me, there is a level of... Um, What's in the box can make a difference. Like um, the amount of components? The amount of components. And, and it's not necessarily um, a long-term weight thing, but it can really make the weight of initial play and, and sort of uh -oh. frightening level of it. Um, Sean just froze. Oh, I didn't on my end. So that's just you. Hmm. I'm good. You're back? Yeah, I'm, I've never gone anywhere. It's oh, your connection. Oh, you froze for me. Okay, yeah, it's and your it's, connection and it though. Said Okay, weird. It's a Skype thing. All right, uh, but I yeah. I apologize. So, no, all good. At least we did, it didn't totally die this time. Uh, I so did yeah. reboot the modem before we started today, so. There we go. Uh, so yeah, I, again, I don't think long-term necessarily it adds to the weight, uh, but especially for new players. Um, a big a game with a lot of components laid out is going to 
give them, you know, scare them, add to analysis mm-hmm. paralysis, even if it isn't actually that much more difficult. Um, it just, it, it adds to that initial weight uh, and, and fear level of a game because fear right. is, fear is a weight, <laughs> you know, it's part yeah. of that weight, you know. It, 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 it adds to that analysis pra- Yeah, it, it adds to that analysis paralysis. If you're so overwhelmed by the number of things out there, mm-hmm. even if you can't touch half of them, um, a lot of players will still be thinking about them. Yeah. Um, the colonists is a perfect example of that. The fact that I didn't have enough bowls for all the different buildings and all the different resources. I think we had nine different bowls of resources that you might have to collect. Now, not having played it, that was scary as heck. But then once we started playing, you realize that in the first era, you're only building, I think it was brick and wood were the only two. And by the end of the game, yes, once you're in the fourth generation, you're building cloth and silk and stuff because, well, that's the whole point of the game is you start off as like cavemen and work your way to modern society. So things like iron show up in era two, right, or era three. I think it was – I think we added – it was stone and wood. Then we added uh, charcoal or something, and it slowly advanced the number of resources. But, man, looking at the yeah, – as Anshi Games pointed out, 13 bowls of resources and just like, oh, my God, what is this game going to be? It was scary. Yep. Yeah, game intimidation is a thing. I just don't know. Does it go to wait? Because once you start playing, there's definitely it's it's almost like a, a game. Intro, you almost need two weights. Uh, once you know how to play yeah. weight and a first impression. But I, or but I think first that's play I think that's always I think that's always a factor, though, because, again, I mean, we've looked at learning the game has been a discussion in several way, uh, portions yeah. of learning this. And once you've learned the game, that no longer that counts weight. towards weight. Yeah. Um, so there really is kind of an initial weight versus a long-term weight. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the weight of, uh, race for the galaxy for me initially was pretty high. I was completely yeah. baffled. Uh, but now, you know, I think three is pretty accurate for it. Now that I'm, uh, now that I'm playing it pretty regularly, uh, as long as I remember to actually look at all the stuff on the uh, play field. <laughs> um, but that's, that's not the, that's not the weight. That's just me playing in a rush rather than, uh, taking my time on turns. Well, that's also the thing we were talking about, about getting to rock the game, right? You can learn to play Race of the Galaxy, but learning to play it well and the experience, like there's definitely a game mastery aspect to Race for the Galaxy. Yes. The more you play it, the more you recognize, you, well, it, it's the same thing with Azul. The first time you play Azul, all you're worried about is your board. Yeah. The second time you play Azul, maybe you're looking at the person who's next. So you're like, huh, I want to see if... You want that tile I want. By the time you play your fourth time, you're probably looking at all the players' boards. By the time you're playing your tenth time, you're possibly counting tiles, right? Like, it's it's how the game evolves. Whereas Race for the Galaxy, again, you're only worried about your hand, your cards, your tableau. And eventually, you might start looking to see if there's cards that the other players have. And especially now that we're playing with Brink of War, you actually have to watch and go, okay, no one has any takeover powers, right? Like, do I have to worry about my military and so on? And then the other aspect of Race for the Galaxy 2 is knowing the cards. Whereas I'm more likely to use the search plus five because I'm looking for that right level six development to go with what I built. Whereas Sean's more like, hey, cool, I got a level six development. Can I use this one? Nah. It's it's a different level of play in a way. Yep. So up next, I want to talk about what do we do with this? Now that we've kind of defined weight somewhat nebulously, but I hope everyone gets what we're talking about. They, all those things together, all those different things come up with a game weight, whether that's a number one to five. I don't really care about the numbers, but I think most people understand what I mean when I say a light game and a heavy game. And while everything else kind of falls in the middle, right? So I try to say medium heavy, which would mean heavier than Race for the Galaxy is probably a good way to put it. And if I say medium light, I mean, it's probably about Catan level, maybe a little higher. Actually, Catan's probably a solid medium weight game. It's, it's, uh, there's enough interactions to me that it's not light, even though it's often a gateway game. I find Ticket to Ride much lighter than, say, Catan because of the trading elements and the fact that you can cut other players, well, you cut people off. The interactions of the cities, the the development cards, things like that, to me, put it above Ticket to Ride. Now, Ticket to Ride, the first time you play, feels lighter than it is because the routes matter more than you think they do. And if people play Cutthroat, it's a very different game. If People are cutting each other off, and which happens from game mastery because once you know the route cards, you can look at what the other players are doing going, oh, they have the New York to Miami route, and I'm going to stop them because I know that one's worth 40 points. I'm totally pulling these numbers out of my head. I don't play enough Ticket to Ride. I don't have that level of... Of mastery and ticket to ride 
Well, and it's interesting because uh, the different versions of Ticket to Ride uh, rank out quite oh, differently yeah. on this on this uh, as well, uh, and more than more so than just I mean New York obviously ranks that's got to be low gonna, is going to rank lower than than Plane yep. Ticket to Ride, but I I think it's the Norse Ticket to Ride I think ranks high is is actually a a weightier game than uh, than most. Well, of there them. are there are significant differences from the different versions. Like Ticket yeah. to Ride Europe adds in uh, underground tunnels, and when you do an underground tunnel, it actually adds a random element where you have to play so many engines, and if you don't play enough engines, you don't get through. So you can actually like waste your turn by not saving up enough engines to get through the tunnel. Right. And it also adds train stations, which I can't remember exactly what they do, but they're a, a whole new level to the game, right? So, so it adds a random element, adds a push their luck element and adds train stations so that's significantly heavier than the base game which is gin rummy with a board yeah yeah actually ticket to ride europe it's uh just below a two so yeah they're none of them are heavy but not no it's not heavy but heavier yep so anyway, I, I hope we've kind of imparted what we mean, at least, when we're talking about game where I think anyone who listens to the show often has a good idea of what I think is a heavy game compared to what I think is a light game. But what do you do with all this? What do you what do we use this for right now that we know what game weight means? I personally find it very useful to determine what games to play during a game night or what games to bring to a gaming event, or possibly more importantly, if I'm gonna set up a tournament, this is something big I use. So I do the Great Canadian Board Game Blitz, the type of tournament I run, where weight is a huge part because it determines different uh, time, game lengths, and the point scale for those different types of games. Now, a couple of weeks back, we were talking about wedding games. Uh, if you haven't listened to that, that's one of our better episodes. Check that one out. Uh, you can hear us talk about games at weddings. And what I talked about then was stick to very, very light filler games that are easy to teach and quick to play. So that for weddings, the first thing I think of is I want light games. So when I start Googling, I want light, easy, quick games. I'm not going to be pulling out any arc rights at a wedding because that's all we're going to do is sit in the corner and play arc right and totally miss that there's a wedding going on because we'll be so focused on doing math in our heads, and making notes on the on the uh, the napkins that we're not even going to notice when they cut the cake. But then opposite, when talking about games for new games, I talked about finding a common ground and. Part of that common ground is figuring out what weight of games the prospective new player is interested in. So weight is just one of those things to consider just right alongside game length and player count and table space they take up and uh, what venue you're at. It's just yet another factor that determines what games are going to be right for your group. So as Sean, not this Sean, Sean Hamilton mentioned in his question, I, I find it's always good to start off a gaming event with a light game. Uh, there's a few reasons for this. First off, it's going to warm up the group, right? It gets people into game mode as opposed to social gathering mode or I just got off work mode, right? It gets you into that. You're at the table. You're focused on a game. And it's nice because it starts things off slow. So it gets people into a gaming mood without saying, you must game now. Come on, try hard, pay attention, right? It's it just gets things moving. Uh, it's also a good way to give people something to do while you're waiting for other people to show up because I've never, ever in my entire life been to a gaming event where the entire crowd was there on time. If we're starting at 5 o'clock and 30 people are coming, all 30 people are there at 5 o'clock, never happened. I don't think it'll ever happen. doesn't matter yeah, how many people say they're going to attend or not. People always slowly trickle in. The other thing is light games help break the ice for new players. So this is great for public play events, right? There's someone walks in, you've never seen them before. It's going to be way easier to get them over to the table and get them playing a nice, easy game of uh, a nice, easy game of Azul or heck, even a Flux, even though I'm not a huge fan, because it's a good way to get everyone involved at a low cognitive load right that also means there's going to be socializing because as sean mentioned earlier you kind of want games where you can chit chat and talk and meet each other and hey how was your week and how's it going while you're playing so you're not having to focus directly on the game you can kind of introduce people and get the social juices flowing unlike anchi games who just wants to jump into power grid and the only reason she plays light games is because it's nice to wait for people. 
Yes, but that is one of the reasons. That's why I said there's a few reasons you start with light games. That 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 one's just as valid as the fact that some people need a warm up. Not all people do. I know Angie Games, if she shows up, Deanna shows up to the game night, and Chad and uh, Justin are there. They'll wander off with uh, some big, heavy, clunky game and start playing brass while we're playing our Azul in case anyone else shows up. That's part of being a good host. I'll, I'll back out of that game for that. <laughs> Now, of course, on the opposite end of the spectrum, so that's how you use those light games to, to warm things up, are the heavy games. Now, these I don't bring to local gaming events usually. I, I don't just go, hey, you're at my house. Boom, we're playing Lignum tonight. No, these I save for special events. I don't bring them out to regular game nights. I don't throw them on the table off the cup. Anytime I'm sitting down to play one of these, it's it's a planned event. It's it's usually scheduled like a week in advance. I'll go out there. And, for one, not everyone likes heavy games. So I'll pick and choose specific players. I'll be like, hey, I'm looking for a group of people. I want up to 12 people. We're going to play a Twilight Imperium game this Saturday. We're going to get together at 3 o'clock. I'm going to review the rules for about an hour because that's how long it takes. Then we're going to take a dinner break. And then when we come back, we're going to get playing. And then after turn 6, we're going to order pizza because we'll have already played played for five hours and we're all going to need a break and we're going to need to eat and then we're going to finish up the game at 3 a.m we're going to call the game whether we're done or not right like it's literally planned ahead um i've done this with twilight imperium pretty much at that schedule um the first time i learned a coin game which fire in the lake which is a heavy game it was pre-planned we had neil come over we had big j come over me and d we had no other plans for the night we cleaned up the game room we set the game out neil taught us how to play we took a a quick break we went and grabbed fast food we came back and we played uh same thing happened when the opposite with the same group of people i taught them indonesia um when i did arc right i did that at the cg realm but it was like that like we actually planned ahead of time there was someone came into the windsor gaming resource group and was like you guys always seem to be playing light games at the game events uh, I want to play something heavier. Do you guys ever play heavy games? And I basically gave him the spiel. I said, well, we can, and there are people who are interested in them, but it's not usually what I bring out. But let's plan a heavy game night. We're going to show up next week at 5 o'clock. Everyone be there by 5 o'clock, and we're, I'll teach Arkwright. And everyone bought in, and I showed up, and I taught Arkwright. We took a break, went to the sandwich shop, got some Coney dogs or other things, and then came back, and we played. So that's what I do for heavy games. To me, heavy games almost require that, like really heavy games. Like these are the, the top ends, right? You're anything over a 4.2, it seems, since uh, I guess Food Chain Magnets, a 4.2. And to me, Food Chain Magnets, that right here, you've hit heavy. So probably anything four or higher would be considered a heavy game. Now, most games and most events I host or game nights in my place are somewhere in between, right? I'm going to start off with something light to get things going, then I usually move on to something heavier. Now, I try to avoid teaching and or playing two heavy games in a row because really heavy games can be mentally draining. And the entire point of playing games is to have a good time, not being totally exhausted and just wanting to go to bed when you get home, which I've had that where I've tried to play too heavy a game in a row and it's no longer fun by the end of it. What I do like to do, though, is if there is time after that heavy game, follow it up with something lighter. Now, I don't like to go too light. Like, I hate going from, like, a big heavy brain burner to, like, a cash and guns, laughing, pointing foam guns at each other. To me, that just there's a cognitive dissonance there where it just it went too silly. But I want something where I, it does require some skill because I'm in that I want to play board games mode still. So I want something that takes some skill but is much lighter. So that's where, like, games like Azul and Gizmos have filled that spot perfectly for me no absolutely uh, and it's one of those things where you know for me uh i i'm not a heavy gamer you know i'm i'm not i'm not with uh there with d and jumping in for the the super heavy stuff but that being said i can enjoy a heavy game but what i've been realizing is for me that heavier game requires more of a theme buy-in um mm. i'm not going to enjoy an 18xx because I <laughs> couldn't care less. Um, yep. The the war game, you know, playing out the, you know, re recreating Napoleon's uh, advance on Italy or whatever. Sorry if I'm horribly messing that up. I don't do history <laughs> well either. Um, I I have no buy in there. I could not care less. Uh, historical games don't do anything for me. Uh, but you give me a good sci-fi or, you know, a good, you know, a good meaty fictional theme, 
uh, that I can that I can get into, I'm right there. So the first Italian campaign happened in 1796 and 97, when on April 2nd, Bonaparte led his army forward into Italy. He was badly outnumbered, and so on. So you weren't too we far go. off. There, right. there was an Italy campaign. I, I did, you know, look at some history at some point in my life. I just tried not go. to. I was never, never good at dates and numbers. That, that's better than I would have known. I, I always forget exactly when or where any of these battles happened. Yeah. I don't. I, I dig some. I gotta admit, every time you say, it, I'm like, oh, I gotta show you some good heavy games at some point. Because I, I gotta admit, it, I, I am a big fan of heavy games, but I need an event for it. I need to plan for it. That's not what I want to play all the time. Uh, part of that being a facilitator, right? I'm I'm one of the local facilitators of local events, and heavy games do not appeal to the average person. Medium weight, yes, but heavy, no, not always. Even people who think they may enjoy heavy games sometimes end up over their head. That did happen with our game of Arkwright. I sold it. I'm like, look, this is a mathy game. It's a heavy game. It's going to take us three hours. It's probably going to take me half an hour to teach. You're going to burn your brain. Are you in? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm in. And I could tell halfway through the game this person probably wasn't having as much fun as they should. And I gave them the option to quit, but they're like, no, no, I'll finish the game. Like It does happen, right? So Major Kayla in the chat, just to remind me, again, uh, this was very board game focused, but I still think all of this applies to RPGs. Now, the one that's very different, obviously, is your decision tree. Because in an RPG, technically, your decision tree is a forest, right? You can do anything. Though, in fact, most times, you're going to pare down that forest, right? Like, there, there's going to be logical choices on what you're going to make. But then, especially if you get into a tactical RPG, I'm going to bring up Shadzar is not here, so we're not going to send him into a rage by mentioning 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons. 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons had a, in my opinion, fantastic tactical combat system that is one of the best board games I've ever played, which is one of the things I loved about 4th edition D&D. Oh, Shadzar is there! <laughs> there we go. Oh my god, I summoned him. Uh. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I had no idea it was in the chat. He hadn't said anything. There we go. Pro Lurker. Pro Lurker. He was just waiting for me there to mention. Fourth waiting edition for the mention D &D. of fourth edition. <laughs> that, that is hilarious. Okay. <laughs> oh, now I'm off totally. But the decision tree in that was fantastic, right? And Arrow will get him even more upset because you would sit there on your turn and you would look at the board state and you would look at your hand of cards with all your powers and your hand of cards was your tree, right? And it was something that many players found very limiting and why a lot of people claim 4th edition was not D&D. Just because they put the powers on cards, I'm not going to get into why or, was, why or was or was not, but yes, you're that game literally limited your decision tree by giving you a set of powers to pick from. An uh, even more modern example of that that Sean is really not a fan of is Powered by the Apocalypse. The entire game is driven by a set of moves. And the set of moves are all the possible things you can do in the game. Now, they're not a limit on these are the things you can do, but these are the things that trigger the mechanics. Anything else you do in the game, you can do, but it doesn't trigger a mechanic. So, again, the cognitive load in a Powered by the Apocalypse game can be very high. Now, the way I play Powered by the Apocalypse, I play it like I play most RPGs. I don't care about the rules. I just tell the DM what I want to do, and then they tell me what to roll. Because I haven't taken the time to dig into any of the Powered by the Apocalypse games I've played, mainly because I don't own them. I just show up and play them at cons. So now I've read Hydro Hacker, so I kind of get it. But I don't make my decisions in a Powered by Apocalypse game based on the moves. I make my decision based on playing a character. But there is another level of play there. The Misdirected Mark talks about this often on their show. Uh, I would point to a specific episode if I could remember which one it is. But they talk about the levels of play and how in Powered by the Apocalypse games, you can step back from the character level to the story level and then from the story level to the narrative level and the narrative level to the mechanical level. I'm probably getting these all wrong. They do a way better job than I can of this, but Powered by Apocalypse has that, and eventually you're going to get that, where the story you want to tell has your character doing this, so in the narrative, I'm going to do this that will trigger that move. I'm not at that level in Powered by the Apocalypse. I actually say Powered by the Apocalypse is relatively heavy and almost crunchy, even though it doesn't use 16 different types of dice, and you're not tracking into 18 different numbers on your character sheet. Yeah, no, actually, Power of the Apocalypse is one of those ones where, and it, it depends uh, a lot on both the player and uh, Game Master um, narrator, whatever the term is in Power by the Apocalypse, sorry. Uh, MC, Master MC, of Ceremonies. MC level. Uh, because, again, you know, 
with you because you're just going to play your character. Mm. Uh, it that is then a very crunchy game for the DM because they need to track what you're doing and the possibilities and work out on your behalf. You need to yep. roll this to make it happen. Whereas um, a player who has delved more deeply and become more uh, ensconced in the game and the mechanics mm -hmm. and the levels, they are taking that crunchiness onto themselves and allowing the narrator to focus on other aspects of the game. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're, you're, there's sort of a, a balance of crunchiness um, as it plays out in an RPG, whereas in a board game, that doesn't happen. Um, right. The crunchiness is the crunchiness for everybody. Uh, there isn't usually, in most cases, uh, a moderator. Um, <laughs> and I was trying not to say that, D, but um, <clears throat> there... Uh, it's definitely a board game is, is more equally yeah. balanced uh, as opposed Actually, to an RPG. Uh, I haven't been on RPG Geek, but I have to assume that all their games also get ranked by weight on RPG Geek because it uses the board game geek thing. What you just pointed out is fascinating because really there should be a separate weight for DMing the game and playing the game. Yeah. And that probably applies to every RPG ever. Because uh, one of the things Powered by the Apocalypse does that people like is the DM doesn't roll dice. And part of that is so that they can focus on things because the DM has their own set of moves, which is something if you haven't read Power by the Apocalypse, you may not even realize. But based on like one of their moves is if the players look at you expectantly, you make a move. And that's how it's written. So if everyone looks at you for you to say something, say something, make one of your moves. And they actually have a scripted list of moves to choose from. So their job is heavier. They have more of a cognitive load. They're the ones that are supposed to be sitting there paying attention to when the players trigger moves. In Powered by Apocalypse, no one should be saying as a player, I do this move. You shouldn't, like uh, Dungeon World being an example. Why well, go up and hack and slash the goblin? You should never say. It's it's not D and D. You're not. I go up and it's. I pull my sword and I stab the goblin. Then the guy goes, "Oh, you're trying to do hack and slash. You're going to roll on hack and slash." When it's played properly, I'll admit every time I played it, people name the moves. Even though I know one of the core tenets of Powered by the Apocalypse is never name the moves out loud. Every time I played one so far, which is not often, I've only played three of them. The DM has called out the moves, but these are all DMs who come from a D and D background right they're all people who come from the traditional role-playing background like me who have a hard time not thinking of things in the move in in you know uh what do you call it in the end of the, the, the three phase actions or whatever you know, you get a regular move a short move and a and a free action every turn right that's we all grew up that way and we either attack or we cast a spell or we take a defensive stance or whatever the options are right power bed apocalypse is supposed to throw all that out so there is a weight rating on RPG Geek, but uh, as we've mentioned in the past, because RPG Geek is less uh, traveled than Board mm -hmm. Game Geek, uh, I would rank it as uh, close to useless. Mm. Um, I'm looking at some really popular games here, and I see five weight ratings on them. So, wow. you know, statistically, yeah. it's not really going to give you what you need. Um, interesting it, it's worth knowing like even, i said it, with rpgs you generally talk about crunch right how crunchy is a game to me that's the main thing but it, it's all of the things we talked about above pretty much apply right like looking let me go through uh rule book is definitely going to matter how thick is it how easy is it to read that definitely going to be a matter of weight look at shadows of the demon lord look at um uh here what's a good example i'm trying to think. look at gurps as a universal system versus savage worlds as a universal system to two, see two ends of the weight scale i managed to read the savage worlds deluxe rule book in a day i'd never finished reading the group's rule book uh game length that one totally does not apply no but i guess you could look at well if you look at something like uh, paranoia versus dungeons and dragons uh paranoia is generally you know you're all going to die in the first in in the first right. couple of sessions it's a quick easy play or if you look at something like um uh biker um you know the the, the biker games or or it came from the late 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 show uh right. they're quick one shot rpgs so a, a one yeah, shot a versus a campaign yeah uh, does really actually apply to weight and uh in rpg true enough yeah i was just thinking even shadows of the demon lord Shadows of the Demon Lord, you're only supposed to play 11 camp, eleven missions. You you level up after each adventure. And it's written expecting you to only play 11 sessions. Now, I don't know if that adds or subtracts to the weight. 
or even D and D. Like again, going back to fourth edition, fourth edition very much expects you to play from level one to level twenty, and there were distinct sections of that game. Uh, luck, yes, definitely. There are games, RPGs with no dice involved. I played one that was interesting, and games with a ridiculous amount of dice, and both are going to affect the weight. Uh, cognitive load again uh, yeah definitely how much do you have to keep in your head while you're trying to play how many different things this is definitely more on the dm side than the player side but also the player side if you're playing a uh, theater of the mind combat system that doesn't worry about terrain weight rain obscurement none of those rules exist you're not going to have to think that much about charging that orc with your sword whereas if you're playing a game where all of those are factors you're going to try to maximize your bonuses and offset the minuses and make sure your players are all in the right position before you roll that d20 that's a totally different style of game than say fate with its zones of combat trying to an interesting one trying to play out a bone golem combat in fate versus playing it out in DD, playing iron edda versus dungeons and dragons and playing out the same fight i have a feeling in iron edda you could probably finish that fight in 20 minutes or less whereas in DD, that's probably a four hour slug yeah no absolutely uh, we already mentioned size of the decision tree. How hard is the game to grok? Definitely. There's enough one shots out there. You can learn to play um, Lady Blackbird in about 10 minutes or um, Lasers and Feelings or Rocker Boys and Vending Machines. Yep. I managed to teach that game in about 10 minutes uh, versus I still haven't quite figured out Pathfinder. <laughs> Learning curve, same thing, right? Yeah. Basically what I just said. Skill required. Uh, some games require more math than others, especially math and RPGs. Well, yeah, look at uh, look at Spreadsheet, the role-playing game. There's been a few of those over the yeah. years. <laughs> yeah, they require definite math. I'm sure there's probably other skills required. That would get into modules. Com modules which should probably all have separate complexity ratings. Does it require logic to solve the puzzles in the dungeon, or can you just roll? Do you just have to kill everything? Shadzar pointed out a good one. Lore, that's an excellent example, actually. How much of the game world do you need to know before you can play? Like if you're going to play D&D in the Forgotten Realms, you need to know what water deep's like. Do you need to know where, where the yawning portal is? Do you know that trolls regenerate? How much lore do you need to know to play this game? I, Which would also apply to most sci-fi or, um, or Star Wars. How much canon do you expect your players to know before you start playing? I think uh, I think the equivalent in board game for lore would be what I was talking about with that whole setup, right? You know, if you've if there's so much stuff in that board game that you're setting up that's scaring you, and and lore is that same thing. It's that setup for the uh, for the campaign uh, mm -hmm. that you have to know and and get past um, in order to to get into the game. Uh, it's that same sort of entry barrier on both of them. And then as for putting it to use, I, to me, the, the, I, I didn't even mention this. I should have mentioned again with board games. To me, the biggest thing weight matters is when I'm trying to decide if I think I'll like a game, I'm going to compare it to games I already own. So same thing with an RPG, right? If someone's trying to tell me, hey, I've got a new fantasy heartbreaker, uh, we'll take a look at Shadows of the Demon Lord, right? So the way Shadows of the Demon Lord was sold to me was Shadows of the Demon Lord's like a modern Warhammer. All right, cool. I loved Warhammer. And it uses a D20-based system. Oh, I don't know about that. D20 based system. I love the D100 system in the original. I'm not sure on that. And it has steampunk in it. Ooh, I'm starting to go downhill. So maybe I get to that point where I'm like, well, is it heavier than Warhammer? Is it crunchier or is it lighter? And then someone tells me it's a quick playing D20 system that's much easier than D&D 5th edition. It's more like 13th age, which very quick combats. And the way skills are abstracted is that you just have a profession and if it applies, you get a bonus. Then I'm like, oh, I like that the weight is lower and that sounds really good because it sounds like it would flow really quick and the fact that non-combat interactions use the exact same skills and system as combat interactions so there's no special subsystem for combat versus social combat versus winning an argument oh i like that too right so that's where i'm going to use this kind of stuff though again most people don't really talk about weight I, I you don't hear many people say oh it's a light rpg oh, i guess i've heard people say light rpg i've never heard someone say that's a medium heavy rpg I've heard it's crunchy and I've heard it's light. You don't usually hear those. There's not as much delineation. No, no. It's, oh, that, it's, it's basically one end of the scale or the other, I think, is really how RPGs generally fall, play out. Uh, it hasn't been, uh, you know, as closely analyzed as board games are. Uh, and partially probably because there are, are uh, less spread between, board. Uh, you know, people tend to stay in their lane more in RPGs, mm -hmm. uh, whereas a board game, you get more 
you know, cross pollination and, and cross play. So people have more experience of mm -hmm. all ends of the spectrum and everything in between. Whereas uh, historically, at least RPGers tended to stick to one or uh, one, one or two games, uh, mostly because of time investment. Yeah, that's, that's something that's changed a lot over the years. There still are a lot of people who have their favorite game and stick to their favorite game. But it seems like there's a lot more uh, people willing to try games, yep. oh, especially the indie scene. The indie scene's all well, about play scene, as many different games yeah, as you can. Yeah, the indie scene doesn't have uh, the same... I mean, it used to be we would sit down for a game of Warhammer and plan out on, you know, let's play these characters until chaos takes over the world or they retire or whatever. Yep. Uh, whereas now you, you you play out a scenario in a in a try out rpg and you you know new rpg and uh then you move on and you try a different game the next uh, next mm -hmm. time or next month or you know however long it takes totally agree so that's it that's it for this week's ask the bellhop if you'd like to read about gaming and game night topics like this be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on gaming advice where you'll see plenty of topics answered in blog form if you've got a question for us, remember, you can head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now it's time for us to check in with those of you here in the lobby, our chat room. And uh, we've got quite a crowd that's gathered uh, from uh, Red Ketchup RPG talking about the original Traveler, Major Kayla. Great game. Major Kayla is talking about uh, uh, with her husband, uh, power grid is of the light side of gaming. <laughs> That's exactly what I talked about with that scale, right? Yeah. Like her husband, uh, when we were at Breakout Con, I remember seeing him and I'm like, oh, he's in the 18XX room. And I was tempted because they had an 18XX teaching room, which sounded fantastic to me. And there was the first session, but at that point we were doing the media thing. And I'm like, I might come back for the later session. The guy told me when the later session was. And then I went by the room and I'm like, oh, they're still playing. And an hour later I went by the room and I'm like, oh, they're still playing. And three hours later I went by the room and I'm like, oh my God, they're still playing. That first game went at least five hours. And I'm like, okay, I don't have five hours to dedicate at this con to learn. 18xx though i must admit i was tempted because i really do want to learn to play 18xx 18xx is another game where i tried to read the rules it had the starfleet battles effect i think i need someone to teach me to play an 18xx game now deanna and i did play through like 1840 comes with two sets of rules it's got a set of rules where you just build the tracks and then you ignore all the stock stuff we played that and my brain was on fire. Like it was, there was math. Like there was, oh, if I play this track, I'm going to gain five bucks. But if I play it here, I'm doing this. And if I do this, she's going to move. Oh my God. And what do I want to do? And this was just playing the tracks. There was no stocks. Like we didn't even get to that second level of the game. And that intimidated me enough that I did not even try the second half of the game yet. I'm like, I need an 18XX expert to walk me through it. Now I did hear the 1840, the version I bought is in the heavier scale of the different 18xx teams like that's such a big 18xx is so big that there's literally a weight scale between them there are light 18xx games and heavy 18xx games but the light 18xx games are heavier than most other games out there yeah well i mean 18 the 1800 or the 18xx game is one of the fives like what there's only there's like four highly rated fives and and 18xx uh, there's an 18 yeah. 1817 i think it is is one of those wow so yeah <laughs> See, unfortunately, I just went with what was available on Amazon when I bought my 18xx game. I, I did not make the best choice. It's it's one of the first, I guess, 1840. It's one of the first that was ever put out. Well, and there there is definitely a. Uh, I, I was noticing a skew where older games tend to be the heavier ones, whether it's because of poor rule implementation or poor rule book design, mm -hmm. uh, or people just trying too hard to make a you know throwing too much into a game. Uh, mm -hmm. where, so you're you're balancing not not uh not making things light but making them lighter and balancing that game so that it falls into a medium heavy rather than a heavy um just because that that's a better balance i think for a lot of games uh, uh, yeah sorry uh we keep growing with the support of fans like you so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox once a week. I'm going to be sending out an email. It's going to recap all the content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, new YouTube videos, reviews, and anything else we create. 
You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Okay, at some point, you're going to be able to listen to onboard games and I'm going to be on it. Like, I, I know I recorded a show with Bruce Vogue and Donald Dennis. I'd sat down, we were on Skype, we talked about stuff, we rambled. But I have no idea when they're actually going to drop that episode because it wasn't last Monday and it wasn't this Monday, so I don't know when it's coming. But it is coming. I just, I, I didn't dream I was on that other podcast. I, I have my audio files in Audacity. I, it was recorded. It'll be out there sometime. I'm not sure what they're waiting for, but I will be on Onboard Games at some point. When it happens, I'm sure I'll share it all over social media. You can find onboard games at inversegenius.com. All right, now time for our weekly Gloomhaven update. Things went so much better last week. Like, oddly better, surprisingly better. I find it really weird comparing last week's game to the week before. And the reason for that is that last Friday was our second try at scenario 20, Necromancer Sanctum. So we played this once before, and we played this the second time, and those two plays could not be more different. Uh, this time, we we crushed it. Like, the first room went better than last time. The second room was almost a joke. Like, we weren't even worried about the, the night demons. It was like, eh, they're done. It was done and over so quick. And then the boss fight just ended up being us beating down the boss slowly until she was defeated uh it just it feels strange to me that the same scenario played so differently both times so sure we knew what to expect this time um yes two of our characters leveled up since last time and yeah i had this kick-ass axe that should have made things easier but the thing is i never used the axe not even once i didn't even use it to hit anything. I Yeah, I feel we played better this time. Uh, we definitely planned things out better, and we didn't rush ahead, and we were more cautious. Uh, sadly, I think a lot of it was just dumb luck. Like, the fact in the first room the cultists didn't summon any skeletons was huge. Like, that made that first room almost a joke, and the only reason that happened was due to luck of the draw. Now, I got to say, out of all the things we did do strategically, that our positioning for the final fight was was bang on perfect. I don't think we could have set that up any better, where we stood, where we got Jexira to move, and how that fight ended. I, I don't think we could have done better. That part was brilliant. But man, I don't know. Overall, it just it's, it's weird that the two plays were that different. Well, I mean, there is a reason that they do put uh, your difficulty up for open knowledge. And I yeah. think essentially this was uh, now at, as the second time through an open knowledge uh, all in. It was a solid outing with a surprise for almost everyone at the end of it. Uh, but yeah. you'll have to catch the episode when it airs to find out what that surprise was. Yeah, there was a big reveal at the end. You're going to have to watch it on YouTube. Now, remember, you can watch the group play Gloomhaven every Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv tabletop slash tabletop bellhop. Or if you miss it, it'll go live on YouTube the following Thursday afternoon for everyone else. Yeah, I do. Even if you just scroll to the end to watch the big reveal. And if you listen, if you tune in Friday, there'll be a spoiler, a big spoiler, because we're going to start off with that big thing happening. First time ever for our group. It'll be interesting. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Uh, every week, we're going to take a look back at the games we played and the events we attended and other cool gaming stuff that's been going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. So this week, I got in some war chests, both at home and at the local game store. I played some Kodama and gave Immortals a second try. And I played Rivals and Forever Evil uh, expansions for DC. All right, yeah. So the after we finished Gloomhaven, Gloomhaven was so easy. We finished by like 11 o'clock. Like that hasn't happened in a long time. It was really early. So we decided to play something else, or I decided we were playing something else. Tori and Kat didn't get up and leave, and they sat at the table. We were talking, and I'm like, well, if we're talking, we might as well play something. So I went and grabbed War Chest. This is the uh, big, nice, solid, chunky, magnetically sealed box from AEG filled with what's basically a bunch of poker chips with uh, iconography on them representing military units. This is um, 
I, I guess it wouldn't be fantasy. I guess it'd just be medieval themed. I was thinking it was fantasy themed, but there's no like dragons or anything. So I guess medieval themed abstract war game played on a hex grid. So it's a chess like, right? This is going to be similar to games like Duke and I guess only Tama, but differences being a hex grid and it's more of an area control on the hex grid are a bunch of control points and you have to control so many control points once you get this x control points you win the game uh and your opponent's trying to do the same and of course there aren't enough for both people to win that you you obviously have to fight over a few of them this was our first time playing four player now we did stream this though for some reason it did not record it locally and as far as we can tell it also cut off the live stream so no one could watch us play so i don't know what happened there uh we do have a copy of the video but it's on twitch we're probably going to release that on youtube at some point but it may look bad it may be jerky because the local recording didn't get recorded what I've got to say here, though, is I've dig War Chess so far. Playing it four player, it was surprisingly good. I did not expect it to be good four player. It, to me, seemed like a two player only game. When you play four players, it's a team based game. So you're teaming up with the player opposite you so that it's your team goes, the opponent's team goes, your team goes, the opponent's teams go as you go around the board. Now, it's worth noting you can only play this game two player or four. You can't play three. Um, so I think you could probably house rule that somehow. But rules as written, you can only play uh, two or four players. We played four players. Uh, we played girls versus the boys. I teamed up with Tori. Deanna teamed up with Kat. Uh, I wouldn't say they kicked our butts, but we definitely did not win. <laughs> it didn't go that well. I uh, did see a bunch of new units for the first time. Overall, really digging the game. Now, I did play again on Saturday at the local game store, talking about starting off with a lighter game. Showed up early, got there right around 5 o'clock. At that point, there was a group setting up a game of Gizmos. And while watching them play Gizmos, another local gamer, Paul, wandered in. And I'm like, hey, Paul, while they're playing Gizmos, why don't we play a game of War Chess before we move on to something heavier? So I played another two-player game. What that two-player game taught me is to start with the basic armies. So War Chest has two set armies you can play with, which is four units on each side. And what I didn't realize right away, because when we learned the game, we use those, is one of the reasons they give you these sample armies is these armies are easier, simpler. They're lower weight than the other armies because they don't have as funky abilities. Like the abilities on them are all pretty basic. So like the, the cavalry moves twice. The heavy cavalry moves, then attacks. There's no weird ones where you're putting multiple chips out on the board. There's no ones where one chip is making another chip move. And there's nothing that makes it so your royal coin is useful. Like, it's all pretty basic stuff. So I now strongly recommend if you're teaching War Chest to someone to stick to those basic eight units. Don't just do random selection. Because I got to admit, Paul was in over his head. He had a hard time... There's enough rules in the game. The game's complicated enough. There's enough eight different options. Each time you talk, we talked about decision trees. Well, every turn you have eight, eight options to do with each of your chips. With that, as well as all the different tactics on the boards, it can be too much. But overall, War Chess still really liking it. I'm playing it less often than I thought it would. Like when I got it, I was thought this was going to be the new hotness. I was going to play it like crazy. And I don't know what's kept me from playing it that often. I think mainly because it's two or four players. But I was glad to get it to the table again. Uh, it's definitely right now for me above the Duke. But that part of that still could be the fact that I played a lot of Duke and I'm a little worn out on it. All right, good to know. Uh, so the first thing I got down the table was the Rivals, Batman vs. Joker, that I picked up down in Windsor. Uh, and I have to say, it's uh, it's a it, so it's a standalone. It doesn't need any of the other systems, uh, but can be in integrated with. Uh, and it's a, it is directly a player vs. player. There's no um, there's no alternate. You're not working working together in any way. It is a straight one v one. Now, if you if you don't beat the other player, there is a, a victory point count up. Uh, for end, but the goal, the initial goal is to actually beat the three versions of your opponent's character. Um, I have to say, it is quick and a really tight game. Um, they have really toned in um, and the decks feel faster, feel, mm -hmm. feel tighter. I was really impressed. Um, now it is quick, so I don't know, you know, it's, it's one of those games where sometimes I just want a little more out of it. Um, and, and don't necessarily want to play a couple of back-to-back. -back. So I'll, in that case, I'd go to a different uh, version. But mm -hmm. for a quick sit-down, Rivals was fantastic. Um, yeah, like even, I'd say 20 minutes 
uh, full game. It's a sixty nice. card, uh, sixty card deck instead of like the hundred plus ga- cards of the uh, the larger ones. Uh, and one of the and the end condition is you know no more cards. So uh, you're really not playing that long. Now is this one's also a standalone expansion? Can you add it into the rest of the stuff? Yeah, or is you it... can. Yeah, you can mix in. It's all it's, you know, again. It's all compatible stuff. Uh, depending on how you want to do it, you'll throw it in the multiverse, and it'll all be integrated using the whole multiverse randomizer system. Uh, but it also displays really well on its own. So cool. Sounds good. Yeah. Up next for me is Kodama the Tree Spirits. I've talked about this once previously on the podcast. I think I played it back in January, so that goes back quite far. Uh, This is a um, card drafting game where you're building a tree. Uh, I think I described it pretty well last time. Very neat game where you're trying to match symbols on the cards to previous symbols. Beautiful looking game. One of the best looking games in my collection as far as artwork is concerned with these cute little tree spirits that look like something right out of a um, Miyazaki movie. Uh, I played this three player. It plays very well three player. The interesting point is the last time we played, Sean Hamilton, who wrote in our question today, uh, happened to run away with the game by building almost a single branch tree. Well, thankfully, before starting this game on Saturday at the local game store, I reviewed the rules, and it ends up, of course, the last time we played, which was my first time playing my copy, we played the Extreme Edition, because that's exactly what has to happen, is the first time you play any game, it's going to be the Extreme Edition, whether you want it to or not. So it ends up, there is a little one paragraph rule in the rule book I missed that's very important. So if you own Kodama, make sure you know this rule. And that is if you are about to play a branch and it would score more than 10 points, you cannot play that branch. So the most maximum points you can get in one turn is 10. So making a huge long chain of mushrooms that goes 18 cards long like Sean did is not actually legal when you play by the proper rules. Which is great because I liked the game when you could do that. And by fixing that, the game just got better. It fixes the runaway leader problem. So I had fun with the game before. Now knowing that rule, the game just stepped up a bit. It just went up a notch in my esteem. I I really dig this one. Unfortunately, Deanna is not a fan for some reason. I'm not sure why. I like it's a set collection game. It just happens to have beautiful trees. I don't know what she doesn't like about it, but I really dig this game. Like playing it this time with the proper rules, put it up a notch to the fact that I think this one may see play even more often. Plus, man, the code are just so cute <laughs> so the other game i played this week would be i got immortals to the table now we talked about this uh last week week before i'm not sure when it was whenever we were talking about when sean was down in windsor and immortals fell flat uh, of the seven games we played it was the worst of the seven i gave it another try because what i found was wrong with immortals the first time is all of us at the table went in with the wrong expectations which is my fault or the internet's fault i don't know how far back you want to go on the blame but my understanding was that immortals was supposed to be a light ameritrash version of wallenstein shogun and it's quicker and more fun and easier to teach and no it was not in any way i would actually say this would be an interesting one to look at the weight on actually it's a heavier version of shogun or immortals uh or sorry wallenstein this is a cube tower game where you are fighting over two versions of the same map so you have the light side and the dark side of the map and you are fighting on both sides of the map and when your guys die on the light side they go to limbo on the dark side and when you put new units out they have to come from that side so when they die on the light side they go to the dark side when they die on the dark side they go to the light side thus immortals your cubes are never removed from the game so it is a really interesting version of the cube tower game but definitely and board game geek confirms it heavier than wallenstein or shogun it's actually Uh, My friend Eugene put it while playing the first time that it's like playing two games of Wallenstein at once, which there's no way to me that's easier, quicker, faster, more fun than the other. Um, This time, though, we played four players and we knew exactly what to expect going in. And I made it very clear to the other players that this is, as someone termed it, a four player knife fight in a phone booth because there is just so much attacking in this game There is 
really hard to plan ahead because there's just so many people attacking each other and the board state on your turn is going to be very different by the time it gets back around to you. And then there's a really funky rule about winning combats and stealing cards that is very counterintuitive. But again, I explained it right from the start first example I gave was someone stealing a card so that everyone knew it going in. And I've got to say that it worked, that we, the four of us who played, had a good time playing Immortals. Now, none of the players who had played in this game had played Wallenstein or Shogun. A shame on them. And I told them all, at some point, possibly next CG Realm game night next week, I'm going to bring Shogun or Wallenstein and show them the real game or the original so they didn't have that preconceived notion of what to expect in Immortals, but everyone enjoyed it. And my friend Scott noted, he's like, holy cow, is this game just all about just stabbing each other repetitively? Like there's you could try to make an alliance, but you're going to get backstabbed probably not even next turn, but probably the same round you're going to get backstabbed after making an agreement with another player. He's like, it is so ridiculously conflict heavy. Now, overall thoughts, I like it. I actually dig Immortals uh, way better play than my last time. What I really don't know, though, is if it's anywhere close to Wallenstein Shogun. Wallenstein Shogun are probably up there in my top 10 games of all times. I don't think Immortals goes there. It's just not as rewarding. It's not as much fun. Uh, it's just it's too random. Like the amount of attacking going on, you can't make a long term plan. Like you're like, yeah, I'm going to build some buildings. But then all of a sudden someone whops in and takes everything for you. Like we had one territory I needed to be able to control all five territories. And there were five fights over that one territory. The last game, five fights in one round over one spot. And in the end, no, I didn't get it, which only meant like one point for me anyway. I probably should have gave up on it earlier. So Immortals, interesting, kind of neat game, but know what you're getting into. Think of it as playing two games of Wallenstein at once. And then maybe if that sounds like fun to you, check it out. But also realize that in Wallenstein, there are two attack rounds every round. In this, every player can attack four times and some of the characters can attack five times. And with four players, that's like 22 attacks going on every round. It's, it's a bit crazy. Uh, yeah, and and uh, I think uh, board game geeks tends to hold up. It's uh, rating wise, Wallenstein and Shogun are trending towards eight, where yeah. uh, Immortals is uh, still a very low count because it's a younger game, but it's around a six and a half. So yeah, that's a big jump. That's a big is. difference. Yeah, I know. I want if you get if you get it on the table a couple more times and continue enjoying it, I would be willing to give it another chance. Uh, I think it would still probably be about a five for me. Um, yeah. But that's more uh, just not my sort of game, I think. Uh, I still think we got to get you to play Wallenstein and or Shogun, one of those first. Yep. So you can kind of see, to, to me, that system done right. Yep. Uh, so the next game I got down was uh, Forever Evil, which is another standalone uh, DC that I picked up uh, on sale. It's a solid game. Not a huge change. The big difference is it's a swap between you're playing the villains. So it's basically the DC deck builder, but you're playing mm -hmm. villains and fighting off the heroes. Um, this, uh, similar to the rogues, has the major implementation of the victory point tokens uh, and a frozen token where so you can actually lock cards up on the, uh, on the, um, uh, the market so that they can't be bought for a turn. Mm -hmm. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty much the same thing with a di with a with a retheme. I enjoy the retheme, and I and I definitely will be playing it and, and you know mixing mixing some of it in. But it's definitely not a must have for the set. It just seems like they're adding a lot of little tiny rules to that game that it might be overwhelming. You know, so what? I guess you're adding it in slowly, to, but to I'm me, like you're adding this token and that token, and now to, you can turn cards 360 well, degrees. And that's that's and... the thing. I mean, we don't play with all the aspects, right? So I, it's a very much. Uh, I, I was talking about it on uh, Reddit today with people that you can customize it to your play style. You know, if you want to have this, you can. If you want to have this, you can. And you know, if you want to have a longer game, throw in. Uh, you know, go to Crisis. If you want to have a short, quick game, go to Rivals. If you mm -hmm. want a few more mechanics, throw in some of the crossovers. Uh, it's very flexible that way, and I like that. So Deanna is asking, what are you going to do when uh, you get to the end of the expansion list? Uh, well, I, they've got more coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe uh, maybe I'll switch over and start Marvel. <laughs> yeah, check out the legendary games. They are very different. They are. 
they're surprisingly different with the whole track. I don't know. Yeah, Again, next time you're in Windsor, I can show you the Alien version, but that's not a perfect example because it's a pure co-op. I don't actually own the Marvel one. Yeah, I, I was actually, I've actually been following a couple of uh, threads on Reddit about it and then looking at people who've had it for a long time and talking about, you know, which expansions work and what, what aspects of the game work and don't. So I have been sort of prepping for potential in the long term because well, again my son loves superheroes so yeah you know it works so now that we've talked about what we played since last week is there anything you're excited to get to the table in the coming week uh well there's a new game i just got invited to on board game arena i'm not even actually sure what it is uh, um <laughs> okay so we'll uh we'll see what it is for some reason it's not in my list of games in progress because it hasn't actually started started yet uh, but I was invited to something new. I, I finally b uh, balked on uh, Libertalia. They, they, I turned down the invitation after this last round. So, I got to admit, I, I'm tempted to turn down Takedo at this point. I'm getting to the point where I've played too many. <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, Takedo is just one of those things where I look over and hit a, but and hit a button. I, it's sort of second nature to me. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have a Takedo game going on. There you go. I usually have two going. I got it down to one. I'm like, I can play one at once. I finished one today, I think. I think I won that one. And I, I'm finally getting uh, gutsy enough in, uh, and, and, and making efforts in Can't Stop. I finally, oh, there you go. I, I You're actually my, pushing found, your luck. I found, I found the level of pushing that I'm comfortable with, and we're all scoring twos now. It's, there not, you go. it's not like one person gets a two and everyone else gets uh, gets ones or zeros. Um, That's still one I, I think I need to pick up. I need to pick up for that lo for the local gamers, for the local events. It, it's it's, it's got great, such a distinct look. It's a great fluffy game. It's easy yeah. to you know. It, it's easy to bring people into. Everyone knows how to roll two dice, um, and it's got a nice little look to it. Uh, it's a great light warm up game. You know, if you've only got a couple of people around, it's easy to sit down. I think it's two to four. So one of the big things I'm looking forward to is I backed the Kickstarter today. Now I won't be getting this anytime soon, but Stronghold Games, despite the fact that Stephen Bonacore said he would never launch a Kickstarter, has a Kickstarter up for Terraforming Mars Turmoil, the latest expansion for Terraforming Mars. And I am in at the Mars Attacks level, which is a copy of Turmoil with all the milestones, as they're calling them, because they're no longer stretch goals because they fund so quickly that they can't even call them stretch goals and they're just going to release one a day uh this thing is at a ridiculous amount of money which for some reason kickstarter is just showing me my pledge instead of uh what they're actually at but it was a few hundred thousand even though they only wanted twenty thousand there they're at 500 and oh wow it just jumped two hundred thousand from the last time i hit refresh it was at 500,000 when I first opened it. It just jumped to 700,000. Yeah. This is going to be over a million dollars. This is one of those ones where you can just watch it spin. It's insane. There's still 14 days to go, and he's got 12,000 backers. So the latest Terraforming Mars expansion is on the list. But I got to say, Deanna is going to force me. I got to go get colonies because I don't even have colonies yet. And I figure I'm going to have to get and play colonies before I even try this one. But this one looks interesting. There's a lot of new stuff. They've got global events. There's a Terraforming Committee that looks a bit like um, Die Mocker, which is a German court-based game that's one of the heaviest games up there. It's really insane. Well, the fact that I, over a thousand people have jumped in on the turmoil level, which is the highest backing yeah. level. Well, that's is... get the game and yeah. the original Terraforming Mars and all you the expansion. Yeah, I mean, so those are everything. people who probably didn't have Terraforming Mars who are jumping in for the first time. Like, that's nuts. Yeah. But I mean, a thousand people who have just decided to jump in on this game. Yeah. Uh, I guess maybe they've they've been holding off and playing other people's copies and in, in, in uh, expectation of this, perhaps. But uh, yeah, there's a, a lot of folks in there, and then a, you know, ten thousand people who are just in for the the basic uh, expansion. Yeah, crazy. So so that's one big long term game I'm looking forward to. As for my local table, I got nothing planned. Uh, my big one was to play Immortals again. And I got to do that. Ends up I do dig it. So I wouldn't mind playing that some more. I do want to play some more Kodama, but I, I don't have any big plans. Friday Gloomhaven, because I really want to see what happens with uh, the announcement that happened last week. I, I want to see that aspect of the game. So that'll be one that I think people may want to tune in to the beginning of the show, at least for. Yeah. Uh, other than that, no, I, st I love to play some RPGs. But man, our Monday night group this week was my fault i ended up canceling last minute this week there's uh we've had some problems i don't know life problems life life has been crap lately right. we'll leave it at that yep
And now a quick shout out and a thank you to our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark join Phil, Chris, Bob, and Candom every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, where they talk games and games mastering right here on Twitch under Chris MMP. Brian Kurtz, thanks. Duran Barnett, thank you. Joe Swick, thanks very much. Jeff Seuss, thank you. William Fisher, thank you. P.S. Goujon, thanks. Danielle Thomas, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Andrew Dacey, thank you very much. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors for the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop, one word. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>